If you would this evening, open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18 is where we're going to be beginning our lesson here this evening and looking a bit at this account, looking at the question and the possibility of causing others to stumble. A good example of this we find in Matthew chapter 18, beginning there in verse 1. The disciples are gathered around Jesus, and at that time in verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them. And he answered, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as a little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck, if he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to the man by whom the offenses come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off, cast it away from you. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, cast it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hellfire. What Jesus is bringing to his disciples' attention is that you are stumbling blocks right now. You are arguing over things that do not matter. You are setting bad examples for the people around you. And you've lost your focus. So specifically with the apostles there in verse 1, when they're coming to him and asking, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, what kingdom are they looking towards? It's not the spiritual kingdom Christ has been preaching. It's a physical one. So they're setting their minds with an earthly attitude on this physical kingdom they think is going to come. And they're so fixated on the fact that I want to be the one sitting at his right hand and I want to be the greatest in the kingdom. They're causing stumbling blocks for each other, for themselves, and for the people around them. The first thing we need to be aware of, and even the apostles fell prey to this, is when we set our minds on earthly things, that's a really easy way to cause a stumbling block. Over in Romans chapter 8, there verses 6 through 8, Paul talks about this attitude. Romans 8, beginning in verse 6, To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity with God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He's not saying that humans cannot please God, that we who are living in flesh cannot please God. If you have your mind fixated on earthly things, you're looking to the wrong goal. You can't be pleasing to God with that mindset. You have to completely get rid of that mindset. The apostles, as they were in Matthew 18, we're not going to be able to be pleasing to God. You are focused on the wrong thing, and it's causing problems not only for you, but for those around you. Also, over in Colossians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, Paul says, If you were then raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not on things of this earth. That was not the attitude when they asked Christ, Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? They were also being a stumbling block when they weren't showing love in that same section. This had been going on for a while, and we've studied some of the other cases surrounding this before, where they were arguing time after time after time after time, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? So much so, they were being really nasty towards one one another. They were targeting one another they were finding ways to one up one another and one to look better and more prideful than one another the world at large was against christ and those closest to him should have been at his side but rather than helping him rather than being an encouragement to him rather than encouraging one another at times they were stumbling blocks they were focused too much 
on their agenda rather than recognizing what Christ wanted them to be doing in the first place. John goes on to later realize this and talk about this more in depth in 1 John chapter 2. I imagine when he's writing some of this, he's probably thinking back to occasions like Matthew chapter 18, when he argued there in front of his Lord, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. In 1 John 2, beginning there in verse 10, he who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness. He walks in darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. John recognizes later in some of his later writings what we were all doing, but what I was doing as one of the apostles was walking in darkness. I was stumbling around and I was encouraging my other apostles and disciples with me in Christ's presence to stumble around. We were arguing over who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom and we stopped loving one another and we were looking to fight with one another. That's a way in which we can be a stumbling block just as they were. The third thing we really see there, and we've already hinted at it, is they were showing pride. They weren't humbling themselves to serve Christ. They weren't paying attention to what he wanted them to do first and foremost. Some of the reasons for why they'd even been serving him up to this point and behind some of their teaching and some of their lack of ability to perform certain miracles was a lack of faith and pride on their part. Because it was all centered around that question, who's going to be the greatest in this kingdom to come? Who's going to sit at the right hand of God? Romans 12 and verse 16 hits upon this idea again as well. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise, or some versions say, do not be haughty of your own opinion. It's exactly what the disciples were doing here. They'd set themselves up a stumbling block for themselves to trip over and for their fellow workers with Christ to trip over. Those are three examples we see with these disciples, but there's a few others that I wanted to point out this evening. Ways in which, not just those three, but other ways we can be a stumbling block. This idea really harkens back to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19, as along with a number of other passages in the Mosaical Law, talked about this idea of a stumbling block. And the Jews were familiar with this term. In Leviticus 19, there in verse 14, You shall not curse the deaf, nor shall you put a stumbling block before the blind. It's the idea that you are not to maliciously go to someone who is blind, who is unable to see, and put something in their way so they will harm themselves and hurt themselves any further. That's not showing love for the people around you. That's being malicious. And when you do that, the rest of verse 14, you need to recognize if you do that, you shall fear the Lord your God because I am Lord. When you put a stumbling block before the blind, either physical or spiritual, I'm coming for you. That's the ideal we're reading in Matthew chapter 18 where he said it'd be better for a millstone to be hung around your neck and you'd be drowned in the sea. Because that's going to be a mercy compared to the retribution that would be to come. It would be better for you to chop off your own limbs than to face the retribution that were to come if you decide to be a stumbling block for your brethren. It's this idea of being malicious. You're going to have to answer to God. And so some of the ways that we can be malicious, even over in Matthew chapter 19, that very next chapter, the disciples ran into this problem again. We can be malicious and we can be a stumbling block when we prevent others from coming to Christ. Matthew 19, let's begin there in verse 13. Matthew 19, beginning in verse 13, Then little children were brought to Christ, that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked him. But Jesus answered and said, Let the children come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed from there. 
It's almost as if they didn't learn the lesson from just a little while earlier that you don't prevent people from coming to me. Well, whatever the case was in Matthew chapter 19, whether they thought Jesus was tired, whether he th they thought this would be too much trouble for him, or whether he needed to move on, or he had better things to do with his time, they decided we're going to be a stumbling block and prevent others from coming to Christ. We can do the same thing too. We can decide that someone is not worth our time, is not worth the preacher's time, is not worth the elder's time to sit down and talk to and study with. We can decide they're not worth our time. We don't think they'll listen, so I'm not going to bother going and talking to them. What that is, is you put a stumbling block before those that are blind, that may be looking for the truth, that may have no idea they're stumbling around in darkness, and you're helping prevent them from finding Christ. That's a stumbling block. It's also a stumbling block when we prevent others from serving God. Over in 3 John, John talked about this problem there. 3 John chapter, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. John writes, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I will come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not only not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish, though, I'm sorry, and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Diotrephes could have a whole lesson in and of himself. But here it was, here's a man in a church that John says we're going to have to come and deal with. Because he's not only prideful, he's deciding who's faithful and who is not in the church. Who can spend time with one another in the church? Who can serve in the church and who can even talk to one another in the church? And he's not doing this from an elder standpoint where he's shepherding the flock and he's keeping out false teachers and he's trying to make sure all things are done decently and in order. He's doing this because he fancies himself high and preeminent. I get to make these decisions for whatever reason is going on in his head. I get to decide who is worthy to be in my presence and in certain brethren's presence and who is not even worthy to walk into the building. It gets over to some of Paul's accounts where he talks about you need to be careful about who comes in that you don't give the rich man the seat of preeminence and the poor man sit at your footstool. It's that same type of idea when we decide, no, you can't serve God for whatever reasons we come up with. I've talked before about churches that said, no, you can't get up and serve if you're not wearing a tie. You're putting boundaries where God has not set them. Or you can't serve and worship unless you're clean shaven. You're binding things that God did not bind. I've seen brethren say, no, so-and-so can't get up and serve in worship. They can't preach, they can't teach, they can't lead a Bible class because they committed this sin 40 years ago that since then they've become a Christian, they've repented and they've changed their life around. All that does is discourage brethren and tell them, I don't want to serve. And I, even more sometimes, don't want to be a part of this church and I'll go looking for another one because the people here are hypocrites. The other word for that is they're a stumbling block. Someone's trying to grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord that we talked about this morning, and you're stopping them. That's a way I have to watch that I don't become a stumbling block. I don't start binding things where God has not bound. One of the easy ones that we got to watch out for is if you start false teaching. Similar in thought with 3 John, that you start binding things that God is not bound, but even more so, you got to watch out for false teachers because those can be a stumbling block. Romans 16 there in verse 17, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which you learned, and avoid them. So it's not just don't be a false teacher because that's a stumbling block because it is, 
More than that, don't give them an opportunity. This happens sometimes in the church when we have brethren that we know cause divisions, cause strife, cause problems that just live to make everybody else's life miserable. And as elders, as brethren, we don't confront them and nip it in the bud. And so we allow them to keep going around and whispering, dividing the church, discouraging the weak, openly being a hypocrite, and we do nothing to stop them. There are a few ways I've seen a church fall apart faster. That's why Paul says, I urge you, brethren, avoid them and don't have anything to do with them. That's why discipline is so important. You allow it to continue. It's not just them that's going to have to answer to God for false teaching, for gossip, for lying, for any of that. You're going to have to answer because you let it go on. It's another way that we can be a stumbling block, even without seemingly thinking we're the one putting the stone in front of somebody else. It's the same as you see someone else put a stumbling block in front of a blind person. They walk away. You know it's there, and you do nothing to stop the blind person from falling. You're just as guilty, even if you didn't put the stone there yourself. A couple other ways we can look at. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, a passage most of us are familiar with. You can be a bad influence on people. Evil companions corrupt good morals. If you act one way in the church on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, on Wednesday night, and then you're around your brethren or you're around your family or you're around your friends the other couple hundred hours in the week, and you're not acting the way a Christian should, well, now I see a hypocrite. Now I see someone who reveals their true colors and they claim to be a Christian. I don't want to go to church with them. We were talking about some of this over Thanksgiving weekend with some different friends and family and brethren here even. That we talked about there's the Sunday afternoon Christians that a lot of places that you go to eat despise. Because sometimes some brethren are guilty of this. They show up to a restaurant. They treat the staff like garbage. They don't leave a tip. They're angry. They're demanding. They're entitled. They're prideful. The worst thing you can do is take one of those cards we have in the back with our information on them and leave that as a tip after you have been a terrible customer. You want to almost guarantee a way that a person never walks in this building? You let your light shine in the worst way possible and tell them where to find you and where you worship. I've seen brethren do it, and it hurts me every time. I've worked in restaurants where brethren didn't know I was working. And I've heard them and seen them from the back. And I was ashamed to tell coworkers that they worship where I do. Got to be careful about who we're an influence on. Close companions or strangers we meet on the street we got to be careful about how we use our liberties. Paul talks about this in detail, both in Romans and in Corinthians, and so we'll just briefly hit upon a couple of these things. But there was a problem in 1 Corinthians 8 that Paul recognizes you have a liberty to eat whatever you want. There is no clean and unclean thing under the New Testament. However, some of you are taking that liberty too far and you're causing stumbling blocks for your brethren. Beginning in verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 8. Food does not commend us to God. For neither if we eat are we better, nor if we do not eat are we worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat these things offered to idols as well? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. 
Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Paul's making a bold statement there to get his point across. There are some of you that do not have a problem with what you are eating, but you are waving in the faces of the brethren around you where I bought this meat from, what temple this food is cut up and prepared by, and you're waving it in their faces because you doesn't bother your conscience, but they come from the background of worshiping at Aphrodite's temple. And so if you invite them over for lunch, and you tell them, yeah, this meat came from Aphrodite's temple. It's really good, isn't it? And they're thinking back to all the times they worshipped Aphrodite. And that's on their mind. And that's what they're focusing on. You're waving your liberties in your brother's face. You're causing the ones that are weak, that are still trying to grow, that are trying to come out of that, to stumble. A modern day analogy of this. Some brethren wanted to get together and play cards. There's no problem with that. They liked playing euchre, so they got together to play euchre. They invited a brother over they knew had a gambling addiction. They invited him over and waved it in his face that we're going to be here and play cards and we've invited you over to be a fourth person. And after a couple weeks, he left the church and went back to blowing all of his money on the slots. They wanted to prove to other brethren he wasn't worthy to get up and lead in parts of worship because he struggled with this. That was their point. What you've just done has caused a weak brother to stumble. And beware, I am the Lord your God, you will have to answer to me. The opposite side of that is also true, though. If you're weak... You need to be careful. Paul deals with this in Romans 14 about judging others' liberties. Romans 14, much more we could get into, we'll briefly hit upon this. The essential message of this is, Paul says, if you are weak and you are struggling with something that is not blatantly a sin, you need to study more and overcome this. But in the moment, if you have a weakness, you need to be careful with where you are judging people and what you are calling a sin. In Romans 14, beginning in verse 13, Paul touches upon this saying, Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean in and of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, it is unclean. Yet if our brother is grieved because of your food, you, no longer walking, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. The problem that was apparently going on in Rome is there were brothers in Christ that were weak in this area. And so they were going to every member of the church and saying, you cannot buy food from this vendor and this vendor and this vendor and this vendor. And you cannot even in the privacy of your own home eat this food and this food and this food and this food. Now you're just as bad as the brothers that weighed their liberties in your face. You're binding where God is not bound and you're saying something is sinful or not. It would be just as bad to use the previous analogy about playing cards we talked about. If you were someone that recognized I have a weakness in the past with gambling and so I'm not going to play cards because I know I have a weakness there and I have a struggle there and I know where my temptation might lead me back. If you then also start binding, you can never play go fish again, even in the privacy of your own home. And if I find out I'm taking you to the elders and you're going to be withdrawn from. That's the example Paul's talking about here. You start judging others' liberties and you start saying, where you have a weakness, that means no one else possible can ever go anywhere near it. That's a stumbling block. Paul also, I'm sorry, Jesus also dealt with the disciples in Luke chapter 17, where he said, if you're willing to not forgive one another, you cause the stumbling block. Luke 17, beginning in verse 1. Then he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offenses would come. But woe to him through whom they do come. 
It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than if you should offend one of these little ones. Therefore, take heed to yourself, and if your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sin, excuse me, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. And the apostles said to their Lord, increase our faith. In a very similar context of what we were talking about in Matthew chapter 18, another question came up from his apostles. How often should we forgive one another? As often as someone comes to you. Yes, when someone sins, rebuke them with the hope they return. That's your job as followers of Christ. And when they come and ask for forgiveness, forgive them. Because if you don't and you hold it over them for the rest of their lives and you wave it in their face and you treat them as now somehow you're always going to be a lesser Christian and you're never going to be the same ever again and will never love you or accept you ever again, what have you just done? You've put a stumbling block in front of someone who is blind, who was fooled by sin, who was walking in darkness. And in many cases, you've just convinced them never to come back to Christ because they'll never be forgiven. All of these we have to be watchful for. We have to be watchful, we studied Matthew chapter 23 recently, of being like the Pharisees and binding human traditions over what God has said. We have to be careful, finally here, of being like the Revelation brethren there in Revelation 2 and verse 14. Over in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 14, it's interesting to note the first things that Christ has to said, say here to the church at Pergamos is good things. Beginning there in verse 13, I know your works, that where you dwell is where Satan's throne is, that you hold fast to my name, that you did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my faithful martyr who was killed among you where Satan dwells. These were, in many cases, faithful Christians that had suffered and come through many adversities. However, verse 14, I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold to the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat food sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. For all their faith, even some there, risking their lives to the point of death to stand for the truth. There was some there who weren't doing as Paul said when we read just a few moments ago back in Romans. You didn't quench those that were teaching false doctrine, those that were causing division, those that were encouraging others to sin. And so now it's not just going to be this one who is like Balaam that is going to have to answer. It's not just going to be the ones that fell for his sin. Yes, they're going to have to answer for their actions as well, but you're also going to have to answer. Because you didn't stop him and you allowed him to put a stumbling block in front of your brethren. At the end of the day, the question is, well, who does a stumbling block hinder? It's not just the blind. Absolutely, it hinders the blind. Those that are walking in darkness, those that are still growing, those that don't know any better, or those that have a weakness. Matthew 18 and verse 6, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, they still sinned. So they're going to have to answer to God for that, but it hurts more than just them, it hurts you. That's why he said in verse 3, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you first get rid of that pride 
that lack of love, that love for the world, and humble yourselves, they're not going to be the only ones that get hurt. You're going to be hurt too. And you're going to regret it even more because you knew what was right. That's why he says there in verse 6, it'd be better if a millstone were hung around your neck and you drowned in the sea. Because you didn't just sin and hold yourself accountable, you led others with you. Stumbling blocks only lead to punishment. That's why he says in verse 7, woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses must come. Sin is going to come into this world. There is no stopping that. Children and people are going to be led astray by Satan and his devices. But woe to the man through whom this comes. Woe upon us if we're part of the cause for them to stumble and fall into sin. That's what we have to be watchful for. That's why the whole message Christ has here is humble yourself as this little child. Those that do that, they'll be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humble yourself and serve God and plan never to put a stumbling block in front of a brother. Be watchful on yourself first and then look out and help your brothers when you see stumbling blocks coming their way. When you see others that are trying to trip them up in the church, in their family, in the workplace, in the home, wherever that may be. Verse 8 and 9 the lesson is yours. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it away from you. It is better for you to enter life maimed or lame rather than having two hands or two feet and to be cast into eternal hellfire. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it away from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than having two eyes and be cast into hellfire. You read some of these New Testament accounts. Where are the lame people? They're begging in front of temples. They don't have the social programs that we have. They don't have wheelchairs and handicap accessible places like we do in this country. They don't have devices that can help them walk better or to the extent or use their hands that they don't have better or to be able to see better like some other places have. Jim's talked about he may have to go in for surgery and may have to end up without being able to see for a year but he'll actually be able to see again if that surgery works. They didn't have that option. You did that and your whole kind of life was over if you were lame or were missing your eyes or you were blind or couldn't walk or didn't have hands. Even still, Christ says, that would be the situation that you are in, that it's better to essentially have no life here on this earth to be by society considered the lowest of the low, that if we have some extra change in our pocket, we'll throw it your way so that you can eat today. It's better for you to enter life lame, maimed, or unable to see than it would be for if you to be fully able to use your body and every function that it needs and be a stumbling block for those around you. That's how serious this is. Even if you aren't the one causing the sin. Even if you aren't the one actually committing the sin. If you're a stumbling block, you're going to have to answer to God. I'm going to have to answer to God. And so that's why we have to be watchful of these things. Yes, we still have to answer each and every one of us for our own lives and the actions we do or do not take. That means this evening answering whether or not I am a Christian by examining and studying God's word, by recognizing what he says about repenting of the sins that are in our life. 
of dedicating our life to him by confessing him as our Lord and Savior and being baptized and striving to serve him faithfully as best we can. We're only responsible for our own actions if after we have become a Christian, we recognize there is sin in our lives. You or I have to pray for myself and yourself that God forgive me, that he'll take me back, and only you can be faithful for your soul and serve God, the same as only I can be faithful and serve God. But part of that also means not being a stumbling block for our brethren around us that are struggling with their sin. Not being a stumbling block for those that are still trying to learn God's word, that are still trying to understand things and being patient and long-suffering with them and teaching them the gospel. So whatever the case may be this evening, as we leave here this evening and go about our business this week, strive not to be a stumbling block. If the need calls for it this evening, that you need to be baptized or you need to repent of your sins, come forward and we will happily take care of that this evening. Whatever the case may be, if the need calls for it, come forward now as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.